All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Cool's Reviews Deep Dives, a series where we look at different films and go in depth. And today we're going to be talking Mothman and Mothman Prophecies, a book and film starring Richard Gere. And luckily, we know two investigators who wrote a fantastic book, Bridging the Tragedy, which I know I plug a lot on the channel. So hopefully by now you have at least read it once. Um, but Bill and Jackie, how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. Good, Keegan. How are you? Uh, we're, we're doing good. Uh, getting ready for all the fun that is 2024. It feels like once winter kind of ends, we, we come out and we start filming. So I'm excited to talk this movie and kind of the similarities to the book, the differences, and how maybe the locals view both the book and the movie. Um, so you guys obviously have been to Point Pleasant, have some extensive knowledge. You've talked to a lot of the people that had actual people on the Silver Bridge or encounters with Mothman. Well, I guess first, you guys saw, Bill, you saw the movie or you read the book first? So I, I uh, watched the movie, which was released in 2002. I watched it in 2003. And uh, it really really captivated me i enjoyed it and at the end of it they talked about how it was based upon real events in point pleasant west virginia and then that got me interested in actually researching and reading and getting connected to the whole mothman community which has really evolved i think since the movie was released jackie same question with you did you read keel's book first or did you see the movie first movie first and then the book and uh, Kindle, paperback, and audio, because there's so much in there. Yeah, I mean, if listening to it, reading it, whatever you do, over and over, and you just keep finding more stuff. The man was a genius. Right. Yeah. There's. That's one thing. Watching this is, I guess, the movie itself is kind of condensed to Mothman and Indrid Cole, where the book has a lot of like UFO and like um, happenings. True. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, a lot of the things that are in the movie, they were borrowed from the Mothman Prophecies book, but not just the book itself, but also from other elements of Fortiana, like the name of the character uh, Gordon Smallwood is actually taken from a Gray Barker book called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. So I think Richard Haddam and Mark Pellington did a great job when it came to putting together a movie that really spoke to a lot of the craziness that happened in Point Pleasant, not only Point Pleasant, but also Long Island, New York during that time period, and then pulled in some other interesting tidbits like the name of Gordon Smallwood. I thought that that was something I didn't realize till maybe 10 years ago. So, yeah. Jackie, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, I agree with Bill for sure, because the, I mean, the movie to have what was it, a two hour movie and try to get all of the high strangeness that was occurring, not only in West Virginia, but in New York, Mount Misery and all of that that's in the book. They really had to be creative to do that. And I think they did a pretty good job because I mean, what my sister said that she didn't like the movie because she couldn't understand it. And it's like you have to literally know. The book to really get a grip on what's going on in the movie because they just had to really portray it being very weird like you just had to like what the hell is going on here you know <laughs> yeah i will be 100 percent honest for the deep dive this was actually my first time watching mothman prophecies so, really? so yeah i hadn't ever watched it. it didn't like on imdb it never had a really high score or anything but i know you brought it up and so as we started to do more and more of these deep dives, I was like, let's do one about Mothman prophecies. It gives me a reason to watch it and we can bring you on and talk about it. But yeah, it's the filming choices I think are excellent because it's almost like the film is kind of going not cl cluttered, but it just starts kind of get scatterbrained. Like there's the red imagery that will, or the fuzziness or the haziness and it starts to get more and more and the sounds amp up. So you as the viewer, you're starting to say, I don't know what's actually happening, <laughs> like in a good way, though, because it just, yeah, I think it's it deserves a better rating than what it has for sure. We'll get to that at the end, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it for sure. And certain parts like um, 
I guess before we skip ahead, but there's parts of it. I was like, okay, I know where we're at, like within the story. Cause like when he's thinking something's going to happen, then it doesn't. And then the bridge collapsed. Cause I remember you telling us about Keel and how he thought one thing was going to happen. And then it turned out it was the bridge. So the main character, uh, Richard Gere plays John Klein in this one, but I think he's supposed to be John Keel. Um, it, they just changed the name for whatever reason, and it's brought up in time to the early 2000s versus the late 60s, as in the real Point Pleasant. How did the atmosphere of the town in the film compare to the real Point Pleasant? Well, we weren't there in the 60s, so we can only rely upon what we've been told of what the atmosphere was like in the late 60s. But one of the things that several researchers have commented on is that the set of the movie, although it doesn't really follow what John Keel wrote about, there is a contemporary book about the Silver Bridge disaster called The Silver Bridge that was released five years before Keel's Mothman Prophecies book was. In 1970, Gray Barker released The Silver Bridge. And the way that that book has been described is that it's kind of a docudrama. It's really closer to what the movie atmosphere is like than what was portrayed by Keel's really reporter type coverage of what happened in the Mothman Prophecies book. So I think that the film really captures some of the spirit of what the atmosphere was like during the Mothman Prophecies time period, 66 and 67, maybe a little bit better than Keel's actual book did, if that makes sense. When we interviewed people, um, some people talked about how it was so exciting. It was an exciting time. And they literally were going out trying to find Mothman and they wanted to catch it. They wanted to know what it was. But then other people talked about it where they, when they were small children, they were scared. Parents were scared to let their kids out of the house. Teachers weren't allowed to let the kids out for recess. They were afraid this Mothman was going to like grab up a kid and fly off with it. So there was there was a lot of fear in the town also. So the movie did portray that people and also the weird thing. A lot of people, a lot of people came forward. But then also during one of our interviews, Susan Sayer said that she's pretty sure her dad saw Mothman, but she's absolutely sure if he did that his mother said, don't you say a word. They're going to think we're weird. Oh. Right. That, you know, that's something we've seen in a lot of different cases with just like ghosts or stuff. We talked to people and they're like, yeah, for the longest time, I just didn't talk about it because I didn't want people to think I was crazy or something. Exactly. Yeah. Keel is kind of like drawn unknowingly because I think he was going to Arlington uh in the movie or not kill um klein mm -hmm. sorry the name change is gonna get me a couple times klein in the movie is drawn to arlington or going to arlington but somehow mm -hmm. finds his way and there's like a pole that keeps him in point pleasant you guys have been to point pleasant do you guys feel like there's something that draws you there like that's maybe not of this world or of this plane there is definitely some type of energy there that draws us because even though we're not presenting at the Mothman Festival this year, we just booked our stay for the Mothman Festival. And it's like every year, it's like, when are we going to Point Pleasant? There's something there. There's something that pulls you in, that makes you want to keep coming back. So for us, obviously, when we decided to go to Point Pleasant the first time in 2016, it was all about the Mothman. It was about the legend. It was about weirdness. It was about what I'd been researching forever and ever. But once we got there and we met Carolyn Harris and then Mark Griffith and then Jeff Wamsley, who has the museum, and we just got more and more connected to people in the community, it became a matter of almost like a homecoming, almost like a family reunion. And what's really neat about the festivals that we've been to has been that it really is a giant family friendly party of like minded people to varying degrees. I mean, some of them are really into the research end of it, like we are. Some of them are there because it's a it's a fictitious you know, thing and nobody knows what it is, so it's fun for them. And a lot of people were exposed by the Fallout video game to Mothman as well. But it's just, there's a, there's a magical energy there. And whether or not it's because of the Mothman legend or because the two rivers come together in Point Pleasant or just because there's some kind of spiritual energy there you can't even really quantify 
it's just a fantastic place and it's got a really positive vibe it doesn't feel negative or foreboding you don't feel scared when you're there it's just a lot of fun to be there right yeah we uh obviously with our talks with you and then we recently talked with a uh Billy the Kid kind of researcher and his name is James Towns and he lives in West Virginia, but his, I think it's his sister or sister-in-law, they have a restaurant in Point Pleasant. And so he was describing, he said he's never been for the festival, but it's a, it's a fun area and all the people are just really, really nice and really, really kind. And that matches what you guys wrote in your book and have told us too. Yeah. But there's a diner scene do you think that's kind of based on the Mothman Diner that's there? The one that was there, Carolyn's Diner. Um, it's part of Jeff's museum. Uh, he's got a display in the museum now. It's called Harris's Hall. So Carolyn Harris lost her son, Timmy, on the bridge. He was two years old. And um, it's got to have been Carolyn's Diner because Carolyn's Diner, when you walked into it, it was like walking back into the 60s anyway you know it wasn't updated at all so and that's what it looks like when on the movie it looks like it's an old time diner even though um the present day of the movie was in 2000 or 2002 or whatever it was that diner scene it's interesting keegan because we watched the movie last weekend just to kind of get our heads wrapped around it again for our conversation with you even though i pretty much got it memorized <laughs> from all the times yeah. i've watched it and listened to it when i'm falling asleep and yeah I'm not quite balanced but we we talked about that a little bit and jackie had mentioned about that scene in the movie where richard Gere is walking towards the tv screen and it says 99 people died on the flight denver nine as he's walking from their their booth up to where the tv is at the front counter you see basically the pictures of the natives, the Native Americans. And I, I could be wrong, but I think it's taken directly from the murals that are on the flood wall in Point Pleasant facing the Ohio River on the West Virginia side. I think that's taken there. And that whole scene is kind of a microcosm of many aspects of the Mothman prophecies. Those were the types of messages John Keel was receiving, you know, cryptic, you know, 99 on flight nine, that kind of a thing. Those were things that he was getting that he tried to decode and then wrote about in the Mothman Prophecies book. And of course, with the flood wall there that talks about the, it, they don't go into dialogue about Chief Cornstalk, but that's the background to that whole aspect of the legend of Mothman as well, too. So it's a very well done scene. The movie itself is, I thought, was actually pretty exceptional. Like it is, it's filmed really well. And like, even driving home after I watched it with Sam, I, I drive and I was like, did I just see something? <laughs> like, because <laughs> it, it, it was good. Um, and you, you brought up Gordon. There's this scene where he gets like held hostage in the, uh, the bathroom there. And Gordon's saying that he's been knocking on his door the past couple nights at the same time. And obviously, He's like, no, I, I haven't been here. You know, I just arrived today. Was that something that Keel had actually experienced as far as someone saying they had been seeing him before he arrived? So that whole scene really is kind of a combination of some different things Keel had written about, both in the Mothman prophecies, as well as some of his additional works. Um, missing time episodes where people would be mystically teleported from one, like one uh portion of of brazil to a different portion of brazil like 400 miles away and that's what was happening there too he lost track of time he drove uh, a distance he never really could have covered without some type of otherworldly aid to be able to make that trip and then to show up on the opposite end of the state but to me that's one of the one of the most chilling parts of the movie where he's sitting with the guy looking on the map trying to determine where he's at. And he's looking at the border of Virginia and North Carolina. And the guy says, it's right there on the border. And he looks at him, he says, with Ohio. And to me, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's a, that's a great scene. We, uh, Sam can tell you, but we recently had a kind of weird time thing happen. Not recently, but last time we went to Roswell. Um, Sam, do you want to tell them about that since we're on the topic of time yeah 
Um, ours wasn't like a leap forward. It was kind of like we were moving slower and time was like, or yeah, we were moving slower and time was going like faster because we were heading up to Roswell at the certain point. Like I felt like we passed through like this bubble or like this, like just like some sort of like bubble, like passed bubble through, passed something. through something. And, and I was, I, I was like looking at my phone, felt us like pass through this, like kind of like field or like bubble type thing and i thought nothing of it at the time and then as we were kept going um our other buddy matt noticed that like we were like moving miles but like the time was just like going like increasing opposed from decreasing which usually when you travel somewhere the time decreases as you like gain in miles but we were gaining in miles and gaining in time and then he mentioned it to keegan and said, like, is anyone else noticing, like, how, like, we are not, <laughs> we're not, like, gaining, or, like, we're not, like, the time is going, like, just, like, climbing up as we're, like, gaining in miles. Like, is anyone else knowing, noticing how weird that is? And then we all started, like, being like, yeah, I thought I felt like I passed something back there, but I didn't really know what to make of it at the time. But now it's kind of coming together, like, maybe we're in some sort of, like, time vortex, essentially. Wow. place for that to happen yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh i was just happy when matt said something i was like okay i'm not crazy <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it, it took an extra two hours that trip yeah to get down there and then coming back we it was normal it was weird that's when we kind of get the realization for um klein that he's in point pleasant because um she points up at the sign it says welcome to point pleasant and it's just kind of these old motels you see that are i guess would fit the time of the 60s and stuff is is that kind of what you see there is some of these types of motels still or have they been updated like i know our town still so our has, town some, still of has some of them <laughs> i don't think point does point pleasant have oh the law hotel what am i thinking they have the law hotel which is definitely a blast from the past because the rooms are even themed with like 50 decor and 60 decor. And, you know, I, we were, Jeff Wamsley took us through the hotel one time. He wanted us to buy it. He said, you, you people need to buy this. And, you know, and I said, it'd be nice to just like update at least the third floor. So that way you could like charge your devices and have USB cables and things like that. And a, and a normal flat screen TV rather than these little tiny boxes that they had in the 50s and 60s. So yeah, the the low hotel definitely, but um and it's also highly haunted. So um I don't know, do you want to start renovating a highly haunted hotel? <laughs> but yeah. I think that's the only hotel that's left in actually Point Pleasant. Otherwise, you have to stay like in Gala Police or go to Ripley or something like that. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of old hotels. Um and and they're not as nice as You'd like them to be if you end up in one of those. So they <laughs> an awful lot more during the festival than they do the rest of the year. We just we just booked our reservations. It, Jackie's found one yesterday that we could get like an Airbnb for seventy five to one hundred bucks a night, which is crazy because the hotel prices that we saw for the Point Pleasant area during the festival what are they two and three hundred bucks a night at least? Yeah, it was like it was like tabulating you know the cost of them and it's like here we're spending four hundred dollars with cleaning service and everything in it in the airbnb and then the next one's like 780 for four nights and then you're looking at 1100 for four nights and it's like i mean even like the quality in where it's not real bad i mean it's okay and it was going to cost us over a thousand bucks to stay there and it's like <laughs> so yowza <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I understand. That's how Roswell gets like, we always are like waiting for them. As soon as they announce it, we try to book it. And usually we just go with Airbnbs because you're right. You can get them for like a couple hundred less than the hotels. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Um, and it's nice because you couldn't used to get even an Airbnb in Point Pleasant. So now people around there are actually thinking, you know, that this is a tourist attraction. This isn't going away. This is not just a September thing. People are here all year now. So, yeah, which is really good for the uh, I, here. We'll, we'll kind of cut out the movie for a little bit. But as far as Point Pleasant, when the actual bridge disaster happened, and I know you guys mentioned in your book, but it really changed the economy and kind of future of the town. So this. 
the legend of Mothman and the encounters with Mothman have really helped bring it back to the public high in a way. You think that's like a correct thing to say? Mm-hmm. It really did. Yeah, it really did because it used to be the main highway right between Ohio and West Virginia went right over the Silver Bridge. And when that bridge went down, they lost all the commerce, not just the east and west, but also from the north and the south. I mean, it really was like the gateway to the west before St. Louis became that. So to not be able to get across the river right there and to have to go all the way down to Huntington, which is a 45 minute drive or all the way north up to Pomeroy, that's another 20 minutes. It really slows things down. And for people who are commuting to work, that really essentially gave them a 45 minute commute instead of a five minute commute at a bare minimum. But all the revenue that was lost to the town as a result of the new bridge going around the town, it took it took the heart out of the town really until the movie. So I think we did kind of work our way back into the movie now because I think the movie really put Point Pleasant on the map. And then Jeff and Carolyn started with the festival and Jeff with the museum. And here we are 20 some odd years later and it's really the Roswell of the East. I mean, it truly mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, like Roswell, there's, especially in the book, there's so much going on besides just Mothman, you know? And I, I think that's what's interesting is, like, why why that time? Why all these things? You know, what what caused it? You know, was there... I don't know. Uh, that's some the fun of it, you know? We've, we've talked about Mothman and comparing it to the Flatwoods monster. Something about Mothman just feels so much different, you know, and that's one thing in this movie is we never really get a clear glimpse of Mothman. Um, At the very beginning, you kind of get your best look when um, his wife crashes the car. But I I like that choice because it's always you're always seeing it or you're always seeing the people from its point of view. I think in the movie, they kind of make the the connection that Mothman and Injured Cole are the same. Is that what Kiel thought as well? No, no, okay. they were contemporary occurrences. But for the sake of the movie, again, with just two hours to work with, they took the Injured Cold aspect and kind of morphed that into place of what Kiel was being for, informed by other otherworldly entities, primarily a couple of characters that went by the names Apol and Agar, and they were channeled to him for the most part through a radio personality by the name of Joanne Ferrano or J.P. Perro, which was her stage name. So he got all kinds of information. The prophecies, um, part of the Mothman prophecies title for the book and the movie really refers to these other otherworldly informants he had giving him information about Dr. Martin Luther King, being assassinated, Bobby Kennedy being assassinated. The Pope was supposed to be assassinated, but he was actually saved from being killed by a potential assassin. So Kiel was getting all this information. In the movie, they just combined all of it and made it an Indrid Cold thing and had Indrid Cold being the one delivering the prophecies and then combining Indrid Cold with Mothman as well. So they had it really as two different aspects of the same entity or perhaps the same entity. Well, some of that was going on with Gordon Smallwood, too, I think, because when when Deborah Messing saw Mothman and Richard Gere didn't see Mothman, it's like right there is, OK, so some people can see this thing and some people can't see this thing, just like I can stand right by my husband and see orbs in the sky and he doesn't see them. So you had that going on. And then you had Gordon Smallwood, who was getting having the same kind of stuff happen to the point where him and his wife ended up divorcing. And that happened with um, two of the first reporters, Steve and Mary Millette, or no, it was it was uh, Roger and Linda Scarberry ended up divorcing, and and Linda Scarberry was the one whose life basically was destroyed by it. She was haunted by Mothman the rest of her life, and became a serious alcoholic and drug addict, and died from that. And her husband went off on his own, you know, whatever. But that kind of is what happened, you know, too. I think they tried to work even in that kind of stuff. If you know the background story, like with the divorcing of Gordon Smallwood and his wife and the haunting it caused him to where he ends up freezing to death out in the woods. That's really interesting. We've never discussed that. But I, I have all kinds of stuff going on in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great insight, though. I'd never stopped and thought that. Gordon Smallwood in the movie, who is really supposed to depict 
Woody Derenberger. Woody Derenberger is the guy who had the encounters with Indrid Cole in, during that, that time period. But I think what Jackie just said, that's a great insight. Again, we'd never discussed it before, uh, that that perhaps, that portrayal of the character basically losing his touch with sanity, not that Linda Scarberry lost touch with sanity, but like Jackie said, she had gotten into drugs and she really was trying to escape from being haunted by Mothman, which she said that she saw dozens and dozens of times after her initial encounter. And they did separate, just like in the movie, Gordon and his wife, Denise, separated as well. Nice catch. Yeah, very, very good insight. That, that, that's great. Yeah, no, his his arc was was very vital, I think, to this, the movie story. And then you, you brought up uh, Messing. Obviously, her character dies early in the film. But there was a scene that at first I thought it was like a editing mistake because the doctor's like she knew and or whoever that guy is in the hallway and the lips and the voice didn't match up and i was like oh it must have been you know they auto dubbed it and it just didn't match up but then at the end when he's in like the factory and he sees that outline and it matches the doctor i was like oh no they totally put that in on purpose like that that's just another yeah that that was fascinating um a mysterious man basically mysterious mm -hmm. men in black that haunted point pleasant that's kind of what I said to Bill. I said, even though he wasn't in black at the hospital, he was kind of like a, a man in black, like delivering messages, basically. Mysterious okay. messages. And then he was gone. He just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And the men in black were seen because I know you talked about it in your book as far as they, they were kind of hanging around or hanging around corners and stuff in Point Pleasant, right? Yes. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. And well, then we see that some of the townsfolk have started to draw the same thing as his wife had drawn. As far as what people drew in real life, was it pretty similar to what, how the movie portrayed it? Or was it kind of like they made it a little bit more Hollywoodized as far as being like that overall dark kind of winged mass? I think to echo what you said before, Keegan, I really liked the way they didn't really paint a clear picture of what Mothman looked like. Uh, John Keel had always felt that his two biggest ideas for what Mothman was were either the Thunderbird, which is the Native American tradition. Thunderbird sits at the top of the totem pole, right between humanity and the gods, like some type of a messenger, or perhaps Garuda, which is the Eastern equivalent to what the Thunderbird is. But he went further with that, stating that different people saw it as different things. Tom Urey, who was the manager of a shoe store, had a, an encounter with what he claimed was a big bird. And now the earlier manifestations and things that people encountered were described as being a big bird. It wasn't until later on, like when the Scarberries and Millettes encountered their, their Mothman that they claimed looked like a black shrouded figure with piercing red eyes that chased them, that when the media got a hold of that, they called it Mothman, which is basically similar to the very popular 1960s comic book television show Batman so they pulled it from there too but uh, I'm, I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there I think did I answer your question <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah we've always kind of had this running joke me and Sam that it was just like a time traveling Michael Keaton because all of Mothman's names are different characters Michael Keaton's played because there was Batman Birdman and I guess in a way Mothman because he's played all these winged guys that look like what you would expect Mothman to look like. And I was like, it was just Michael Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was. Who knows? He'd have been pretty young back then, though, in the 60s. Right. I, I like that because it's very Jaws-esque not to show whatever. And it builds the suspense. But at the same time, it's like, is it really there? Or are the people, like, is it in their head for the movie, right? It builds that suspense. You don't know where it's going to go. What's and so, really good about that, Keegan, is that that really, the way that they do that with watching Richard Gere slowly lose his grip on what's grip. going on, it's very similar to the way Keel started to depict his encounters. And he was getting wiretaps, and he felt that he was being followed by CIA, FBI, Men in Black, whatever it might be. He developed almost a paranoia to the degree that it was very difficult for him to function and they do a good job in the good movie, job in the movie having, having gear look that way as well. 
Yeah, because wasn't it some of his like family and friends that were like, hey, you're getting way too attached to this stuff. Like it's affecting you way too much outside of the research, right? There were there were a number of people that he was close to that that did express concern for him. Yes. Well, and I think as far as the movie, it slowly starts kind of unraveling as he unravels. And, uh, you know, slowly there's red lights, but then there's the like old static. He will start appearing more or just like it'll come blurry more or lights will kind of appear where they're not supposed to be. And I think that helps the viewer kind of digress as they watch it too. And so I think, I think that's good. And I think slowly after he starts kind of interviewing some of the people, he starts to kind of think something's going on. It might be related to his wife. Now are some of the encounters as far as like at the factory, obviously we know the like kind of lover's lane thing or real kind of real things that happen. Um, but what about like the lady being kind of watched out of the tree? Was that like in a real, real account too? I'm trying to think now, was that the lady, that the lady describing, the describing the one who the one? they go to her house and they're looking at a tree and saying his head was like right here, like about right nine or 10 feet up in the air. Yeah. That, that did seem to kind of dovetail pretty neatly with a few of the different descriptions of the interviews that Keel gave or did when he was uh, talking to people in the, in the community. Yes. Yeah, see, I think it's always good when you actually tie in the real stories. You know, sometimes I think Hollywood likes to, like, not condensing, because obviously you got to, but just, like, put in things that weren't there to try to make it scary. And I'm like, sometimes, like, truth is scarier than fiction, you know? And so yeah. I think that's good when they, they stuck closer to the real, the real thing. Pretty soon after he starts after talking he starts to people, because he talks like the, talks fire like the fire chief and stuff but he realizes that gordon's been talking to a guy named injured cole now how much of that actually affected point pleasant or like you said was at different places like where did injured fall and was he really communicating to a lot of people through these static communications the injured cold encounters happened previous to mothman really manifesting in Point Pleasant. It was just a few days before, maybe a week before the Point Pleasant, uh, Rogers Scarberry and Steve Millette and their wives uh, encountered Mothman in the TNT area. But Woody Derenberger, who is Gordon Smallwood in the movie, was a, he used to work for Union Carbide, which was one of the big employers in the Ohio River Valley. But he was laid off, as a lot of the folks were at those plants over the years. And he took a job as a salesman and he was selling appliances and such. And he was driving an equipment van home in, in between Mineral Wells and Parkersburg, which is about an hour, hour and a half away from Point Pleasant. So same state, but not, or same, not really same region. And as he was heading home, this, this uh, craft kind of came around him, passed him, but passed him from above. And the way he described it was he was buzzed by this this uh, craft that stopped in the road in front of him. But it was, to answer your question, right before everything started really taking place in Point Pleasant. I, I was thinking about um, Andy Colvin, who we interviewed, and he's, you know, put a lot of Kiel's works on Amazon. And um, he was talking about Indra Cold actually living down in the Charleston area and that he was like a, a men in black type of a person that he believes actually caused his father's death. He got, his dad got shot in the back, I believe with a needle or something, and which caused a tumor to grow there, which was cancerous, which he died. So he he holds Indra Cold responsible for the death of his father. And they do bring Charleston into the movie very, very small. Like, I mean, in my opinion, they were adding Charleston as a place that was close enough to Point Pleasant that you could have the idea that it might be linked to Point Pleasant somehow because he was supposed to be flying. She's mentioned to him to fly into Charleston, but he couldn't get a flight into Charleston. So he had to go into Columbus, Ohio, which is odd because that's where Andy and Harriet both live now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, they kind of lay these Easter eggs throughout. You know, they name different places to get the mind thinking because some of these are you know you'd start digging you're like oh i wonder if that's that's connected and you know with 
some of the visions we've seen. Oh, what was her name in the movie? The 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 sheriff. Um, Laura Linney. What was her name? Connie. Connie. Okay. Mm -hmm. She she had the um, vision of the presence on the on the water, which is something I've said stuck with me since I read your book. Like that's just such a haunting image. Did you guys, through your research, find anyone that had that vision that was on the bridge and then survived, like had that similar experience? Or is that more of a Hollywood kind of dramatization? That was not a Hollywood dramatization, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, well, several people said it, but Mark um, Griffith, when he was talking about it, he didn't believe in Mothman. Which was which was funny because he seemed the most freaked out by some of the stuff that he talked about. But he said, "You have to understand." And he looked very upset. They were telling us that there were presents floating on the on the water. And Linda Lane confirmed it. She saw the presents. Um, and I, I think uh, I can't think of his name, whose parents were lost Denny on the bridge. Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy said that there was presence on the water. And he also confirmed that he saw what he saw was a man floating down the river on semi trailer. So I think that they were trying to add all of that stuff in when they were talking about the prophecy part of the presence on the water. I don't know who had the Mary Heyer, I guess, had the prophecy dream. Mary, Mary did. And there was another lady, too. Um, her name was Virginia. She lived out in uh, the TNT area on Camp Connolly Road. Uh, I'm trying to think what her last name is. It's escaping me at the moment. But that that whole idea, Connie Mills really was Mary Hire. Connie Mills, the the cop, was Mary Hire in the book. She was the she reporter was for the Athens, Ohio Messenger, and she did have the vision of the the presence floating on the river. She told Keel this towards the end of the Mothman prophecies. It's in the book. And this other lady, uh, at the very beginning of The Silver Bridge by Gray Barker, he goes into depth about this lady who had what they called second sight or some type of psychic ability where she was having visions as well, too. Like I said, when I was reading your book, that's something that's always stuck with me. It's just that how they describe how dark it is, but you could just see the presence just drifting on the water. So that's, yeah, that's something that stuck with me and. So once that scene came up, I was like, okay, I know, I know where that that happened, and uh, that's really when I think Richard Gear, um, his his character, just kind of like he starts beating up the phone, and he doesn't even know if he's saying like he's looking in the mirror, and he like bashes his head in, but then it's like not real. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. does Keel kind of go into that as well? Like, did he start kind of breaking down? Like, he wasn't sure reality from not. He, he did. They, they weren't exactly the same types of things as depicted in the movie, but close enough that it, it made perfect sense. I was going to say, uh, when Jackie and I watched the movie last weekend, and granted, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen the movie, had it running in the background for background noise, what have you. But I haven't paid super close attention to it since we did the book. And when the, when the scene comes up at the very end, it was very touching for me having interviewed those people that talked about their experiences um, of their friends and their family members dying. I mean, it really touched me. Jackie looked over at me. She could see me kind of fighting off tears because it's become very real now. It's not just a movie or a story. We've been part of the whole thing. People have told us what their experiences were like, and you feel that. So it, I, it really, I hadn't, I hadn't taken stock of how much the whole thing had touched me until we watched it last weekend. Yeah, no, I can imagine you guys were able to talk to a lot of people with firsthand accounts and like you said, lost people in the tragedy. So I can see how it would change your outlook on on it. And, you know, it's it's something when we've done certain research projects or we've been able to talk to people and we go back and look at things. We're like, well, this is different now. You know, it's changed for us. And yeah, no, that's a. Uh, it's it's crazy for the the bridge like they did pretty good recreating it looks a little bit shorter than what it probably would have been it looked you know compressed but for the overall design it looked good and so they start showing it more and more as the movie progresses and you know he gets the whole 
premonition from Indrid that there's going to be a tragedy on the Ohio River. So he mistakes it for the power plant in the movie. And that's where I was like, I was talking to Sam because we watched it together. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is where he thought when the Christmas tree came on that something bad was going to happen. And so do you want to talk a little bit about that, like the premonition he thought versus what, you know, happened in the movie? Keel did think a chemical plant was going to explode. He did think that that's what the prophecies were leading to. He really kicked himself for not being able to put two and two together to figure out that it was the bridge, which, I mean, how do you do that? How, how would you possibly, possibly know that? Well, he also thought that there was going to be a blackout in New York City when they lit the Christmas tree, and that didn't happen. So isn't that right? You're right. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. So. I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because... That was the other piece that I just forgot. I'm like, I was going to say something else and I forgot. That's why I stopped, stopped kind of abruptly. But when they light up the Christmas tree, when he returns from Chicago the first time, after he talked to Alexander Leak, um, that I think was supposed to be symbolic of the whole Christmas tree lighting up type thing and expecting the big blackout to happen, which never does. So is, and Alize Alexander Leak is supposed to be John Keel also, the other side of John Keel. Leek spelt backwards is Keel. And I don't know, but John A. Keel was his middle name, Alexander. Is that why they did that? Because there was John Klein, which was close, and Alexander Lee and John A. Keel. I don't know what his middle name was, but I bet you it was Alexander. Actually, it was Alva. His, oh. first, his, his first name was Alva. His middle name was John. But he changed his he name to John A. Keel, and he respelled the way Keel was spelled, because it was spelled, I think, K-I-E-H-L, and he changed it to K-E-E-L. But you're right. I mean, the the Richard Gear and uh, the Alexander Leake characters, uh, they, they're they supposed to be two different aspects of John Keel's personality. So when they're actually conspiring or talking about what Alexander Leake's experience was like, it was like, it's really just like two parts of his psyche in reality. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, because then they're in that kind of like dim, dim room talking together. So it's kind of like his brain in a way, you know, sit aside, just talking together, trying to, I guess, figure out what he's experiencing. Oh, that's a that's a cool insight. And I did not put that. I was trying to figure that out when we watched it. I was like, I wonder, wonder who this leak guy is supposed to be. So well, and Jackie came up with something that I think maybe we've talked about in the past. She and I. But I'd forgotten about entirely. Maybe she came up with it all by herself. When he goes to Chicago, you want to you want to jump into that? No, go ahead because I'm not sure what I came up. I remember. So, the Mothman, the traditional depictions of Mothman were Point Pleasant, West Virginia, but there have also been other sightings and reportings from all over the world, right? So, the one most recently within the last decade or so has been the alleged Chicago Mothman. And so Jackie had mentioned to me after or during we were when we were watching the movie last weekend, maybe the whole Chicago piece in the movie is what set the stage for what's been developing and reported in the Chicago area as well. And the uh, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe it is. Who knows? Who knows? But it, or maybe people are putting two and two together and expecting that Mothman is supposed to be in Chicago because of the movie. But it's not that, nothing I'd ever seriously considered until she brought it up. And I thought, hmm, it's one of those things where you, you, you have to think about it, you know? Yeah, you, you were talking, because I know you brought up Charleston earlier, Jackie. So it's kind of one of those little Easter eggs. It's like, why did they put that in there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about this before, Keegan, but Charleston really very well could have been the epicenter for the Ohio River Mothman sightings had Mary Heyer lived there because there were other reports, all kinds of reports that were coming in from Charleston. And Charleston is a 50,000 person community compared to Point Pleasant, which is about a 10th of that. But Mary Heyer was in Point Pleasant. John Keel arrived in Point Pleasant and that coalesced into the investigations that became the Mothman flap of 66 and 67. Had they focused on Charleston, it might've been different. And I don't know if you knew this or if we've talked about this in the past, but the Silver Bridge collapse happened to the day, December 15th of 1967 is when that bridge went down. 
but the Elk River Bridge in Charleston went down November the 4th, or I'm sorry, December 15th of 1904. So the very same day, 63 years later, it happened again. I did not know that. That is, that's interesting. Did they have sightings there before the bridge then too? Of yeah. the Mothman? Mm-hmm. Oh, before, yeah. be, no, I, I, that's, oh, I'm no, wrong, not, I'm sorry. Not, not prior to, not in, well, if, if it happened, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know prior However, to the 1904. Yeah. I don't want to dovetail too far off, off point here, but the Van Meter visitor, didn't that happen in 1903 or 1904 in Van Meter, Iowa? I think that's when that was. So not that that's anywhere close to Charleston, but the timeline is interesting. I'll have to look that up. Right. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to talk about that. We uh we've been talking about Mothman a lot on the on the channel. We uh we've been doing some cryptid shows and stuff and Mothman's so interesting. In the movie they they make him out less of a cryptid, I guess, and more of like a interdimensional being, which I, I feel like is what a lot more people kind of lean to now. Is that kind of how you feel too? That's how I feel. I think that Mothman is um transmogrification of energy and people see it differently so some of the people that literally could have seen something because it didn't match the descriptions of what's being reported didn't report it and there were over a couple hundred reports right there was at least over a hundred reports jeff said and so he said for all of the reports that were reported jeff wamsley he said imagine all of the people that didn't report it because it's a very christian conservative area and like Susan Sayer said, her mom said to the dad, don't you dare say anything. People will think we're crazy, you know, so. Yeah, which is something they, they kind of showcase in the movie, too. They keep bringing up that these people are just, you know, hardworking Christian folk and they're not going to just come out and say it to say it. So that, right. you know, flirted there. We found yeah, the thing, too, when we interviewed the people that we did, that everybody was really pretty conservative. The only, the only, um, more sensationalistic interviews that we had would have been Andy Colvin and then Harriet, who they were in Charleston when they had their encounters, Andy with Mothman and Harriet with the UFO that she talked about. But everybody else was very, very conservative, very much, very believable. Not that Andy and Harriet weren't, they were just more on on the opposite end of the spectrum when it came to experiences. They had more paranormal stuff happening to them. Andy had mo- a couple Mothman sightings, and the paranormal stuff started happening in his life then. And because Harriet lived in the neighborhood, and another one of their friends, Tommy, I don't remember what they call him for not anonymous, but Tommy, um, he he also had all kinds of really weird stuff happening to them, like really weird stuff. That whole area where those kids were living is highly active so um i don't know if it's like a tr- i don't know if it's an interdimensional type of stuff that comes through or if it's spirit or if it could possibly be like you know government ops doing stuff but like we did a spirit box se- session a couple of them there and it was pretty insane insane to the point that we had harriet and andy on a zoom meeting and um, I was doing the Estes session and Bill was literally, Harriet said she was getting somebody with heart attack, heart attack. I'm naming names. Bill's having chest pains. And I don't know what's going on because I have on the headphones and I'm like getting this motion like like somebody's rocking the hell out of the vehicle and all of the stuff's going on on the outside. And I've got spirits or whatever fighting to communicate through me. So that whole area is just insane in itself. So if that story would have stayed in Charleston, who knows what would have developed? Because Point Pleasant's just small, and it was crazy there. Yeah, when we were talking to James, he uh, he was just on. There's certain places that are just different. Like you don't know what, but you feel. It. And he said, obviously, he lives in West Virginia, and that's what he said. He said uh, New Mexico, and I was like, well, what about Kentucky? Because Kentucky's kind of has that aura. So I don't know what it is about those places, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe I, I it's the water the too. Energy, especially the first time that we went to Point Pleasant, the energy seems similar there to what I've felt in Sedona, Arizona. It just, mm-hmm. it, it, the, the, the air just seems to crackle. 
with with positive like electricity is what it feels like mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. not like you're being electrocuted but you feel energized it's it's a really neat feeling yeah more connected to something beyond our human 3d existence right yeah no it's it's i think fun of part of the fun of the field is there's still a lot to learn and you know we got to study it and sam knows i'm pretty critical about when we study things because i'm like well we got to weed out what's not true and true so we can follow that but mm -hmm. yeah there's still so much to uh to learn about and yeah kind of getting back to the the movie is so kill ends up back at home and you know gets talked to coming back to point pleasant and that's when he finally puts it together because there's that big traffic jam which is something that really did happen on the bridge and then he's like oh no he tries to warn people but then the bridge collapses and compared to like what you've heard and from your guys's research is that pretty close to how the bridge fell or was it more instantaneous you know was it slow like um, were people like really knowing what happened or was it just so quick it went down in seconds is what we were told and um we were told that by denny bellamy who said that the bridge you know turned this way then it turned that way and then it flipped all the way over flipping the you know vehicles off um and also charlene westwood's dad watched it happen and it went down in no time flat there was no time for people running get out of the vehicle get out of the vehicle type of stuff it snapped and that was that there were stoplights that were out on both ends of the bridge so that's why the cars were piling up they were both they were both stuck on red which we were told happened quite often so um that wasn't unusual if it's something that happened quite often but the bridge did go down quickly people had no chance to try to save themselves and the water was you know frigid icy cold water so to even survive if you did go in the water if you were pulled out hypothermia was killing people so heart attacks somewhere, somewhere we scared. were told that it sounded like the people went into the water you'd hear hear sounds like mooing like a cow uh, because people were just shivering to death and just it was just a horrific horrific scene yeah you could hear screaming they said they could hear the screams of people and um and that could have been the screams of people trying to save them too because there were literally somebody in like a tugboat or something um i think it was a tugboat that pulled one man out of the water and he was a semi driver and he survived it but um he shouldn't have survived because he went way down and he had on balloon like pants from that filled up with air and they were like pulling him down as he was trying to get back up and he had to lose his pants to get out of the water and then a boat was there and pulled him up so um i can't i can't imagine i can't imagine what it was like to actually be there and have all of that horror going on yeah it's, it's how you describe okay. it, it's kind of similar to what i think of when i read, when I read um, um the people from the lifeboats from of the, the titanic life just the sounds and stuff and the yeah. movie actually tones down the death count because it was higher in real life, right? Yes. So I think it was 46. Yeah, right. 46 people died and they had 30, 36 people die. Because Laura Linney was going to be 37. wake up number 37. Wake up. <laughs> I thought that was nicely done. Nicely so done. They did the, the, the foreshadowing. foreshadowing. She was going to be number 37 and had no idea what that was. I I, I really liked the way they played that, that arc out through the, the movie. You know, can I say something about that wake up? Because I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys can figure out exactly why that was even put in there. Because when you're sleeping, you're not aware of what's actually going on. And they're telling her to wake up, wake up. Is there something there with that story too? Because... I mean, we talk about all the people that are sleeping and they don't know, they don't, they don't care about paranormal. They don't care about UFO. They think it's all, you know, whatever, we're all crazy. And so we're awake and they're sleeping. And now we have wake up number 37 in the movie. That's actually taken from the book. When, when, it? when uh, different contactees were experiencing some of these phone calls, um, these really odd voices would come on and they'd talk about them being, sped up or some garbled version of uh, Spanish and German 
or what have you, but then it would slow down to the point that you could actually understand some of it, and then it would speed back up again. But um, that was one of the things that Keel wrote about, that at one point there was a strange phone call that happened, and somebody somebody said to them, wake up down there. <laughs> that's oh, wow. That okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, no, it's kind of where I was thinking was like people wake up to like, it's real. Like, you know, this stuff is going on. Mm-hmm. You got to let yourself know that. And there's that kind of brief little glimpse at her radio transponder and it just says 37 right before her truck yep. goes into the water. Yep. And at the same time for the movie aspect, I was like, well, maybe she was hearing Klein's voice because um, Gordon kept seeing Klein before he showed up. So maybe that's something that he said to her. Like, I don't know. It's, it's part of the fun of the movie is you're just like, there's many possibilities of what could be happening. In a... Not, not yeah. that I didn't like Richard Gere or Laura Linney and their performances. I thought they did fine work. But the Alexander Leake character, even though he's on only briefly, tremendous. He just did a fantastic job with that role, as did Will Patton as Gordon Smallwood. I really think he steals the movie. I think his his whole story, although it was largely fabricated, um, the way that he dies is so poignant, and it really just sets Keel off on the deep, or Klein off on the deep, deep end as he's trying to figure out what's going on. I just love the way those two roles worked. They were they were awesome. Yeah, the whole getting a phone call after he's been dead for hours. Yeah, that that's creepy. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when uh he's in his hotel room and first talks to Indrid himself and it's just telling you know Indrid's telling where everything is and he's reading lines and yeah i think that's kind of sets the tone okay something is how it's just not just in his mind and i think that's a good part jackie did you have a scene that really stuck out to you what scene stuck out to me i love well, i'm i like the uh Alexandra Leak stuff too. I mean, that was, I guess my favorite is when John Keel, John Klein is asking Alexandra Leak, um, why can't we know? Or I don't remember exactly what was said, but he's like, he's like, we don't get to know. That's the part that really gets me is because I'm like you guys, the more we learn, the less we know. And it's like, why is it? It's like any, okay, so like the Chicago Mothman stuff, for an example, that when you start investigating that, there is such a weird underlying story that's there. And it's like, the more you chase it, the weirder it gets. So that's kind of what I feel like with the Mothman of Point Pleasant. The more you learn and the more, and the more the movie went on and the more you read the book and, and, get a grip which takes forever because there's so much in all of it that the weirder it gets and the less we know so i guess that part is like the part that really gets me because any paranormal type of stuff that you try to figure out is like why can't we know because we don't get to you know (laughs) another thing to just kind of piggyback on what jackie just said I i love the alexander leak character and just the way the information that's disseminated when he talks to him is just outstanding. And the way he taught when uh, John Klein asks Alexander Leake, we can take it for granted that these things are more intelligent than we are. Why don't they just come out and tell us what's on our mind, on their mind? And then Leake looks at him and he says, you're more intelligent than a cockroach. You ever tried explaining yourself to one of them? Oh, yeah. No, that's one line I liked. And I also liked when he was saying, well, just because the uh, the guy up on the scaffolding can see the car crash doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yeah. You know, because we oh. can't see it. So I like right. that explanation. I doesn't thought that mean was that a... he's even smarter than we are, but from where he's sitting, he can see a little further down the road. Right. right. Mm-hmm. I've right. seen it too many times. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that is the whole the whole um, Alexander Leake thing is it's there's a lot in that even though it's very brief the both both scenes are pretty brief there's a lot to think about with all of what was said there it's kind of like the same like you know was it the government that was like bugging 
the phones and putting these messages or even like, you know, are they able to like literally get into our communications when we're doing spirit box sessions? We don't, we have no idea what anybody or anything is capable of. It could be anything, you know? So, um, yeah, I go out. I can get out there. <laughs> hey, there's a there's a whole Project Blue Book episode that's kind of dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. It's it's really good because um, they go in depth about what's that one Skinwalkers and Poltergeist and EVPs. It's it's really good. It's in season two. I'll have to look it up, but I'll I'll send you whatever one it is. I really okay. enjoyed that show. There were a lot of uh, UFO purists <laughs> who didn't like it at all because it was too fictitious, and I get that. And Dr. J. Allen Hynek really wasn't the way he was portrayed, but that was a fun show. I mean, it yeah. was just a really fun show. Yeah, and again, they they kind of do the Hollywood thing of condensing things and moving things around, but I, I liked it. And it, it get, got a lot of cases out there that are weird, and then it, it did the good thing of these cases were clearly not real, you know. And I like where it separated the two, so then there's still that question, what happened there, you know. Mm -hmm. Sam, what was your favorite scene? Probably when his car like dies, because it's like almost like like a lot of cases with like UFOs where like the electronics and everything like shuts down when something happens or like when there's like an overwhelming energy presence. Like I think I really enjoyed that scene, and then the one that followed where he gets held up in a bathtub and then they become best friends after that. <laughs> <laughs> I told Sam, I was like, yeah, that's how we met, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, I did really like that scene just because sometimes with like that otherworldly presences, it does like shut down like everything and nothing is wrong with the car. Like the mechanic told him that, like the next morning, he was just like, I couldn't find anything wrong. That is still happening in Point Pleasant. In the TNT area, vehicles oh, are still oh. stopping, just shutting themselves off and starting up and when they get checked out there's nothing wrong with the vehicles it's still a, it's still a real thing there interesting interesting a little bit yeah. more history they got in there yeah, yeah. susan yeah. sayer told us that i'm getting goosebumps and i'm thinking you know we go out through the tnt all the time because you have to drive out through the tnt at least once when you're out there and it's like i don't know what i would do because we do it at dawn and at dark what the hell would you do if your vehicle shut off out in the TNT? i mean it's creepy well, that out there you know, that brings up another good point, something that, and you know, we've been going out there for going on 10 years now, but when we were out there, I think it was, was it at the end of the festival or one night with Michael Hacker, who narrated our audiobook? Oh, we were driving to the TNT area. In, in the movie, there's a part where, as they're building this friendship, um, the Gordon Smallwood character and John Klein are walking out of a hardware store and John Klein says, Gordon, your ear is bleeding. Now, that is part of the Mothman Prophecies book when a group of investigators were out looking in the, the TNT area for Mothman. And then I think it's uh, Mary Millette. Her ear started bleeding. And the way Keel described that was he thought there was a change in pressure, which caused like the bleeding to happen. But when we were in the TNT area, was it your was it your ear that started bleeding or the, was next, it my the next morning the next morning my ear started bleeding and it bled for two days and when we left point pleasant it stopped <laughs> didn't something happen with me too there, yeah, was, but I there, can't remember. there were a couple of weird things that happened the ear bleeding and then something else but i don't remember what it was yeah something weird happened to you and when That's we were in columbus leaving columbus we saw a black ops completely black ops helicopter flying it's like, what is that over there? And it's like, Bill's, of course, he's just going to drive. And like me and Michael are going, but what is it? Really? What is that black helicopter doing there? And I'm like, oh, stands, I'm just trying to make good time. <laughs> Columbus <laughs> is like the gateway to the weird because it's normal. And then you leave Columbus and it just gets weirder and weirder as you're going down through Ohio until you get to West Virginia. So it's like. Michael's like, well, I'm glad I'm going with you because if anything paranormal is going to happen, it's going to happen with Jackie in the car and my ear starts bleeding. It's like, okay, well, here we go. She does. She has all <laughs> kinds of strange occurrences. And since we moved into this house a little over a year ago, I've begun experiencing some weirdness as well, too. And uh, that's a, probably a topic for a whole other day because we're supposed to yeah. be talking about the movie. It's a deep dive. We can go as deep as we want. <laughs> <laughs> True. 
But just so people know, it's really happening. So go to Point Pleasant, right? Because mm -hmm. nothing well, has ever really felt foreboding, though. Yeah, even with the ear bleeding, it's all, almost kind of like, oh, there's another connection between us and the Mothman prophecies. It's Let's like talk funny. About something else. Yeah, it's like funny. It's like. My effing ear is bleeding. Look at that. I'm like, I'm telling him, like, look at this. Look at this. Look at what's going on. I have blood on my cuta. And it went on for a couple of days. So it's like, nothing well, freaky, that. nothing scary. It's just like one of those things where you're scratching your head again because why? What the, How? What about that coin we found at the Quality Inn in our bedroom? Yeah, that was weird too. Yeah. It was a. Uh, so we went to the festival and it was. We got up Sunday morning. So the festival is Friday, Saturday. We were there. And Sunday morning, I'm packing up stuff. I put my suitcase on the bed. And right on the sheet or on the bedspread is this dollar coin of, they used to make dollar coins of different presidents. And I think it was Eisenhower. And it was just like on the bed. And I'm like, we slept in this bed two nights. We made our own bed. We had up the do not disturb. How is this coin on our bed now? It would have not been on there. No way. Mm -hmm. So that was a weird thing too, that that coin just appeared. And I don't know. I don't know why. I still have it. I'm not I'm not spending it. It's linked to Mothman. We asked Harriet. She's psychic. And she said definitely linked to the festival in a way. So oh, that's really cool. The, um, yeah. What what do you guys think the whole can like? Because there's the uh, was it the curse too, or the was it Chief um what's his name? Hornstock. Yeah. Do you think it's connected to him too, it or is it predate him? My perspective on that has changed since the last festival, and I'll tell you why that is. So, I don't know if you've seen the Small Town Monsters, uh, the Mothman of Point Pleasant documentary. It's they do a really good job of kind of laying out what happened during those months. Um, Denny Bellamy, who is one of the Point Pleasant icons when it comes to Mothman and anything going on in the community, he's really been a big part of the festival since its inception. When we interviewed him, he, interviewed him. he had basically gone back into his back, back into office, his back office. came out with a oh. brochure or a playbill for a play that took place back in the early, was it 19 teens or something like that? 34, I thought, but I'm not positive. In the 30s. He said that there we have the chief cornstalk curse. It's verbatim. So this is something that was manufactured. So the whole legend of cornstalk basically states that this Indian chieftain who was trying to prevent further colonization by the settlers uh, was involved with a skirmish, was taken prisoner, and was basically murdered point blank. But when it happened, right after he was shot, he cursed the land. So when we met Lynn Robinson, who is Mark Griffith's half-sister, we first met her. She had told us that there's no way that a native would have ever cursed the land. And she was a great, great, great descendant of Chief Cornstalk. So that kind of changed our mind. And then Denny basically showing us this playbill made it look like the whole Cornstalk curse was manufactured. However, local Point Pleasant author George Dudding has done some extensive research on the curse of Chief Chief Cornstalk and published a book that we we bought from him at the last festival. And I read that shortly after the festival. And he has all kinds of documented proof that there was historical evidence for belief in the Cornstalk curse going back to the 1800s and the early 1900s. So now, you know, I don't know that a curse had anything to do with it or not. I discounted the whole thing before because of things we had learned over the years. And now I'm kind of thinking that might be an element to it. Yeah, some weird things happened in Point Pleasant. I mean, it's had a lot of a lot of tragedy in Point Pleasant, like the jail explosion and people were, you know, died in that. And when they were trying to set the obelisk in place or the cornerstone first, I think for the um, Revolutionary War deceased soldiers, lightning on a very clear day struck and busted the capstone so it delayed the the obelisk was delayed being built and then later on um, months later on when they went to put the capstone on the same thing happened lightning struck again struck the crane i think but it damaged the capstone so that, i mean it's like floods all kinds of very weird things and it's like lynn said that you know native americans 
take are caretakers of the land, but they may Cornstalk may have felt. I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know that he cursed it. But what I think is, you know, the burial ground is the TNT area for the Cornstalk burial ground, and you know that's where T, that's where Mothman was originally sighted. So you hear about a lot of weird things that happened where there are burial mounds. So it could be something to do with the burial sites, just without having a curse even there. It could have something to do with the burial sites. It could have something to do with the Thunderbird. It could be, a, you know, a Thunderbird, and maybe we don't understand what a Thunderbird actually look like. It could have been more of a spiritual type of bird for Native Americans. I don't know. But I kind of believe that there is a Native American connection to it, especially with the energy out there feeling so electric. And it's not like an, it's not like an energy like Bill was saying. It doesn't feel foreboding, but it does feel like there's like a spiritual type of electricity there that could stop things from happening if it wanted to or start things from happening if it wanted to if that makes any sense at all it could just be the it could just be the confluence of the rivers too that make that can that make that um electricity feeling of the air but i think it's i think there's spiritual something going on there so i wouldn't say to discount anything to do with the cornstalk legend what's interesting about cornstalk also is that i think it was 1774 that he died is that right is that right yeah. So if so, it really were a 200 year curse, that brings us up to 1974. Things didn't really start turning around for Point Pleasant until about 30 years after that. But who knows? I mean, if really he did somehow invo invoke some spiritual powers that we don't know about, that maybe it started wearing off 30 years prior to the movie being released. And then the movie came out and then things started changing in Point Pleasant. But to Jackie's point, the area is thriving now. There are different businesses, restaurants, gift shops, what have you, opening up every year. And every year that we've gone back since 2016, and we'd always gone, you know, before publishing our book, we'd always gone during the off season, not during Mothman Festival. We never attended a festival until 2022. Every year during those off hours, there are more and more people in town. In fact, we were at the festival in 2021 when it was canceled. And there were still all kinds of people that were still there during that time. So, I mean, it's it's really attracting more and more tourism all the time. But we went in it, July it, last year. We went in July and because we wanted to be able to see Jeff because we like to go out and spend some time with Jeff right before. And we can't do that at the festival. And the street was full. Streets, there were cars filling the streets. And it's like, I posted on Facebook something about, you know, I took a picture of all of this and I said, what well, was once a sleepy little town of Point Pleasant? You know, it's like not anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we see the same with uh, Roswell because there'll still be lots of people going, obviously, because, you know, the, the crash or whatever. But during the festival, it's like a whole different thing. Like there's people from all these different countries and the roads are closed down and it's just, it's a really fun atmosphere. Like I definitely want to get out to the Mothman one sometime because... Just sounds like such a good like time, such a good time and and to see all that, yeah. stuff. All that stuff. Now, Bill, uh, with the um, Mothman Prophecies book, is there anything they left out of that outside? Obviously, we talked about UFOs that you thought was a major point in the book that didn't make it into the film. Oh, that's a good question. Maybe I can come back to that because it's escaping me now. I'm sure there are things I'm just not conscious of at the moment that would have been really nice. I guess. I guess the first thing is. And I knew they had to do this for the essence of time, and it made sense to combine Indrid Cold with, with uh, the whole Mothman thing. But if there was a way they could somehow have done more of the Men in Black stuff, there was some really interesting Men in Black appearances in the Mothman Prophecies book. Mary Heyer had Men in Black encounters. Her niece, Connie Carpenter, had Men in Black encounters. Carolyn Harris told us about the Men in Black and she described two different types. There were some that they knew were from the government, other ones that she said they weren't from around here, kind of inferring that they weren't either, either not American or possibly not human. So the whole end of the men in black could have been played up a whole lot more. And then one thing they didn't really have time to get into 
was Keel was going back and forth between New York and West Virginia during 66 and 67. He wasn't there the whole time, but all these prophecies that were given to him were coming from a place called Mount Misery in Long Island, which is where all kinds of strange occurrences were going on that Jay Perro was reporting on and then ultimately was channeling these otherworldly, quote, quote unquote, otherworldly entities to John Keel about the prophecies. So I guess those are the pieces that I would say I would have liked to have seen more elaboration on, or maybe certainly the Men in Black encounters, because that's a big part of the book. Jackie, did you have any thoughts about that? I would say the UFO activity, because they didn't bring UFO activity into the movie either that I can think of. And, you know, that's partly why we wanted to make sure that Andy and Harriet were part of our story, a part of the book, because there was a lot of UFO activity. John John Keel and Mary Heyer would go out on Camp Conley Road. And at one point, John Keel um, flashed his flashlight to try to communicate with the lights that they were seeing. Carolyn told us they were the most beautiful lights she's ever seen. Um, and Carolyn's brother had a UFO land in his backyard. And then Harriet had a UFO sighting and her sister had a UFO or Andy's sister had a UFO land in her backyard in Charleston. So there was UFO activity in Western West Virginia during that time. But when John Keel was flashing his flashlight, um, the UFO started to come down in a leaf like pattern. And Mary said to him, what did you say? And he said, I said to, he did use Morse code and he said the word de descend. So there was communication with UFOs also which some people speculate that UFO, the alien, the Mothman was an alien that came from one of the UFOs and the UFOs were there searching out Mothman. That's, yeah, no, that's a cool take there. I have not heard that one. It definitely makes you think, because yeah, with Keel's book, there's a lot of UFO stuff. And yeah, that would, I guess that would make sense if they were looking for like Mothman for whatever reason, you know, maybe yeah. Mothman got lost or escaped or, Whatever. Left behind. Yeah. yeah. Left. The, yeah the saucer oh, took wow. off without him and they had to come back and try to find him. <laughs> well, and Linda Scarberry talked about that with Mothman. She felt that it wasn't always a menacing thing so much as sometimes it looked cold and it looked like it was alone and that it was lost. And so um, maybe it was left behind. But I mean, to Jackie's point, she's right. There was more UFO activity than there were Mothman sightings. And that was going on even a little bit before the Mothman sightings occurred. Yeah. Hmm. And some of our witnesses from the from our interviews saw UFOs. So, I mean, we only had a handful of people and they were seeing UFOs in their late teens, the ones that we talked to. And Denny, I don't know how old he was, but um, there's all kinds of reasons for the thought of UFO activity, but I don't think Wright-Patterson Air Force Base covers it all. <laughs> <laughs> But it is somewhat close to that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that Wright Patterson, I, I'm sure they test UFOs in the, in West Virginia and the Ohio River Valley there because it's dark in West Virginia. But I also don't think that the amount of UFO sightings, it was a flap. It was huge. So I don't think that that was all Wright Patterson Air Force Base. I think there was a lot more going on there than than all that. Right. It is interesting how there is a lot of activity or UFO sightings around military bases. We've we talked about this not too long ago, me and Sam with a guest. And mm -hmm. it's like, what's the connection there? Are the bases there because of UFOs or people saying the UFOs because of the bases? Like what what's causing it, you know? So it's yeah. it's interesting. So I guess overall, Bill, what is your feelings on Mothman Prophecies the film? Well, it got me into the whole thing in the first place. So it's got a very special place in my heart, in my life. Um, I would have to call it my favorite movie, although I don't think it's the best movie ever produced. But it was the gateway into this whole last 20 years of our lives, I think. It introduced us and got us, and got us into this whole thing. This whole thing so it's really important to me, and I do think it's a good movie. If you had to rate it out of 10, what would you give it? You know, I want to say eight, but eight, I think but seven I think is probably, seven more, probably realistic. more realistic. Just because there, there are certain aspects of it. 
it doesn't it doesn't do a really good job from a thriller perspective of really having a crescendo at the end. When the bridge goes down, it's almost a little bit anticlimactic because all along you're building up this paranormal tension that never really gets it never really gets defined. defined. Now, that, yeah, that's that, very that's, similar that's, to how the book is and how the legend is, but in terms of a thriller, it'd be nice to have something a little bit more powerful at the end of it uh, to depict what was being portrayed earlier on in the movie, if that makes sense. So I, I'd probably give it a seven. Okay. Jackie, what about you? How do you feel and what would you rate it? Well, I think that if you don't know, if you haven't read the Mothman Prophecy, I think that it's more like where my sister comes from, that I just, it was just too weird for me. You know, that's that's like a person that's sleeping, look, watching it, it's just too weird. But if you're, if you're aware of paranormal and you know that weird stuff happens, then I think I would rate it probably like seven and a half, eight, because it does have, it does a really good job of the, of, of grabbing the weird from what was going on. It does a really good job of grabbing the weird and it does a good job of um, telling the story that John Keel thought it was going to be the, the chemical plant and his shock when it was, the bridge that actually went down. Um, it, it does a really good job with that. So I think I would give it an eight. Okay. Yeah, I, I was debating last night and this morning, what, what would I give it? And I think, because I kept going between seven and eight, so I was like, 7.5 is right in the middle, so that's probably what I would give it. And I, for being that we talk a lot about paranormal, I'm not a huge fan of paranormal movies. I don't know what it is. Is it because we research? What do you, what was that look, Sam? <laughs> I, I would say this one is one I actually I I enjoyed. I thought it was good. There's a couple other things or TV series like Project Blue Book I enjoyed, and The Changeling uh, with George C. Scott. I don't know if you guys seen that, but it takes mm -hmm. place in the movie in Seattle, but it's actually about a park in Denver that they built over a cemetery. Like it's kind of a true story. Ooh. Yeah, so I recommend that one too. But seven and a half for me, uh, Sam. What about you? I don't know. I I definitely really enjoyed it because, like, from the beginning, from the like, beginning. as Keegan and I were and kind I of were like kind watching of it, like we kept like there was like parts where you're just like, oh, it's gonna pop up here. Like, is this like a horror movie? Like, they made it seem like the way they filmed it was like really well done because they made it seem like things were happening and like him and I were both like. Is it right there? Are we seeing things? Like, what is happening? <laughs> like, we kept like we had to like rewind it a couple times because we were just like, was it right there in like the shadows back there? Like, it makes you like just you, like, being, like just is it like, like right there like, watching and like how they filmed it as like it was like flying over the city and like just they 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 filmed it really well and there's parts that you were just like interesting choice but like it also added to like the telling of the story and like i'll probably give it i'll definitely give it probably a nine i definitely really enjoyed it it was definitely worth it like it's it could be like a starter like if to get you into it and then you can check out the book and get more in depth of the like the truer story of it but like the movie would definitely like give you that initial like shove into it essentially yeah, that's that's one thing I actually forgot is we kept like saying things that were never brought up. So like when um, <laughs> Klein's wife hits the glass later when he's driving, you see it behind him and it looks like a moth. Like the mm -hmm. cracks are in the shape of a moth, but it's never like talked about. Mm -hmm. And then when he's like freaking out in his apartment and he like slams the door, it almost looks like Gordon's reflection was like in the mirror instead of his yeah and so there's all these little tidbits that were like was that real was that there like what's going yeah. on yeah. Yeah, yeah i forgot about that because yeah the uh i think it was the glass crack that looked like the moth that got us really starting to like all right what is and then there's a lot of um like pairings so there's always like two columns or two christmas trees and there's a lot of these twos 
Mm-hmm. So it starts getting you thinking like, why are they putting the symbolism in there? Like what's going on there? You know? So I forgot, yeah. I forgot about that. Well, yeah. and then to kind of end off the movie, it shows that the, uh, it says that the Mothman hasn't been seen since the bridge collapsed, but maybe that's not a hundred percent accurate. Right. Cause the story's continued. Right. And have actually kind of expanded outside of just point pleasant. Yeah. yeah have- they have. Go ahead. You can go ahead. That's fine. Oh, but they did continue. There there was Mothman sightings beyond that. But what we were told multiple times is that in Point Pleasant, people didn't dare talk about Mothman because they were dealing with funerals and, you know, family deaths and friends and, you know, the bridge collapse. All of that was like just such a traumatic time for all of them they were burying people at christmas time so mothman was a big no-no then it's like nobody they didn't care if you saw mothman you better not talk about it yeah. kind of that is completely fair yeah understandable things just got really serious then and mm-hmm. it was such a palpable tragedy with the bridge collapse that it just sobered everybody up so whether or not things were still manifesting People weren't talking about it. They weren't focusing on it. You were focusing on the, whatever they needed to do to help their community members. Mm-hmm. You know, that makes 100% sense. You know, Mothman is the unknown and the tragedies are the known. And it's a lot more real and sobering, like you said. And Well, thank you both for joining. This has been fun. We've been able to talk about the movie and get a lot of insight for people I mean, obviously, there's the Moth and Prophecies book, but you guys wrote a really good book. You know, where can they find that and where can they see you and maybe a little bit more about the festivals and stuff like that? Uh, the book is available on Amazon, so they can just go to Amazon and buy the book. And as far as, um, well, anything big would be the XCon coming up in October in Springfield, Missouri. And I don't know the dates. I don't remember. I know it's over the 14th of October. So it's a weekend where the 14th is involved in it. Um, And then we have like some book signings and things coming up locally. You you know what we have, right, honey? We we do have a, we've got a presentation going on for anybody who's in the Northern Illinois area. We'll be in Rockford on March the 23rd at Bay's Books. It's right downtown Rockford. Rockford is not a huge metropolitan area but it's about 150,000 person in the community. And it's close enough to Chicago that if people are interested in learning about Mothman from the traditional aspect of Point Pleasant, we'll be talking about that at that presentation also. And then we're also going to be, um, I think, is it April the 11th? We're going oh, yeah. to be Rock for the Mutual UFO Network presentation, History, Mysteries, and more. We'll be doing that with uh, Sam Maranto, who's the Illinois State Director of the Mutual UFO Network uh, will be presenting down there as well, too. So that's coming up in Ottawa, Illinois at Stark Rock in April. And we, and like I said, we booked our stay for Point Pleasant from the 19th through the 23rd. So if anybody's at the Mothman Festival before or after and they see us, we love talking to people. So just stop us and introduce yourself. Can I say one thing, though, about also about the movie that is really cool that yeah. I learned? So I watch American Pickers off and on. And I think it was like season 15 or 16. I'm not sure. They literally were picking a place where the father and the two sons made uh, stuff for movies. They they created different things. They created the bridge and all of the cars in a large like structure for the destruction of the bridge to go down. And so Mike from the Pickers literally bought one of the cars. It was like pretty good size you know so it was a pretty good sized uh display that they had to build for the festival so if anybody is interested in anything like that i'm not sure exactly but just google it and see you know when the pickers were buying the car from the mothman festival movie because that was really neat too and another another thing too i'm glad you brought that up is that if you do make the trip to point pleasant and you go there during the off season, you can get into the Mothman Museum and take a look around and check out all the memorabilia that Jeff has there. He has the telephone that Richard Gere was pounding at. That's there. Oh, really? The uniform <laughs> that Connie yeah. Mills or Laura Linney wore as a cop 
that's in there. So he's got all kinds of, of the drawings such from the movie yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. And letters from Keel. Keel had he donated some of his letters that like from um, Kennedy and different people that he J.P. Peril that he had been consp um, conspiring with or corresponding with. So if you want to see the Mothman Museum, don't go during the festival because the line literally wraps down the block and around and it's a long mm -hmm. line. Right. That's what that's uh, the UFO Museum in Roswell. If you want to go there during the festival, make sure you get there's express passes and you can just walk in whenever. Yeah. Do not wait in the line because you're going to be there all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Je Jeff does have piles of bridging the tragedy sitting right next to the Mothman prophecies by John Keel, which is uh, to me, that was so exciting to see that. Yeah. Right. It's come full circle for you, right? It yeah. has. It has. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And you guys, obviously, I have your first edition behind me but you guys also have the illustrated edition out now as well um yeah. one last thing how do the locals feel about the movie i guess it depends who you ask some people leave town during the festival because they don't want anything to do with it and um other people think that it's just fun that it's just a fun part of history for them to have all of that mystique and you know mothman itself I know we asked uh, Linda Lane and Marva Bailey, who are both in our book, about what they thought about the movie. And I think the, the main vibe that I heard was they watched it like outdoors, like at a drive-in. And they said it's because it's so dark, it was hard to really see it on that screen outside at night. Um, but I don't remember either one of them having a real favorable report of what they thought the movie was all about. The one thing that somebody did comment to us, and I don't remember who it was, is that the movie itself, and we knew this, it did. It wasn't done in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It was done in Kittanning, Pennsylvania, which is like a couple hours away from there. And somebody had made the comment that Richard Gere, that was because he didn't want to stay in any of the hotels that were in Point Pleasant, so they did it in a different city. So I don't know if that's legit, but somebody that we talked to had that, that thought. <laughs> That would make sense because the low hotel is like haunted and it's creepy and the movie itself scared the hell out of Richard Gere. Just doing that movie was very scary for him. So I could see where he wouldn't want to stay in a haunted hotel. Right. I think it's the only yeah. time he's done like a horror genre movie is Probably. the Mothman prophecies. Yeah. What's really interesting about him is that he is a Buddhist and the idea of Mothman being a Garuda, Garuda is a Buddhist entity. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it, it hit different for him, for sure. Yeah. So once again, Sam and I want to say thank you to both Bill and Jackie for joining us and helping us give a really in-depth look at the Mothman prophecies, both the movie and the actual history behind the movie thanks to their extensive research so make sure if you haven't yet go check out their book bridging the tragedy i do highly recommend it but until next time for more cools reviews deep dives click that link to your left for more about what we're doing here at cools paranormal click that link to your right and don't forget to hit that like and give us a subscribe and let us know have you seen mothman prophecies and if so what did you think of it tell us in the comments below